scientifically, though not technically correctly, refer to altered versions of proteins as mutants as opposed to the normal or wild type versions. And so these altered proteins, we can use different terminology in order to describe the alterations, whether they're letters change, substitutions, which we might represent with something like an E6V, or whether maybe there are insertions where we add letters or deletions where we remove letters. Um, we can remove them from the ends. We can have truncations. We use this delta notation where we have this triangle. Um, and so you might have like a delta 600 to 1000 where you're removing amino acids 600 to 1000. So all this different terminology. Um, here's how we use it. Here's how to interpret it. Just a quick guide as I wait for my mutagenesis primers to arrive. Technically speaking, mutations actually happen at the level of the DNA, the level of the gene, and not the level of the protein. So we technically can't refer to these proteins with these amino acid changes as mutant proteins, but we typically do anyway, especially in um, laboratory work in biochemistry. But if you talk to people who are dealing more with things that happen in the wild, um, maybe viruses and things like this, um, they might be very specific about wanting to use the term mutant and mutation only to refer to changes in the DNA. And this distinction can matter because changes in the DNA may or may not affect the protein. Um, so some, because there's this redundancy in the genetic code, where basically you can spell the same amino acid, so you can spell the same protein letter the same way, you can have changes in the DNA that don't affect the actual protein sequence. Um, so these would be changes that we would call um, either synonymous if they don't change the letter of the amino acid, or they could just be um, mutations in like non-coding regions. So they wouldn't affect the protein, the protein sequence, but they could still affect how much of the protein is made and things like this. So that's just a technical note, but we're gonna be using this, for, this term mutant and mutation pretty broadly to refer to the protein as well, because this is how we typically use it in day-to-day -day usage in the lab, at least when we're talking about like biochemistry. So let's talk about how we can refer to some of these changes. The simplest type of change to think about is a substitution, where we're just changing one of the protein letters. So the instructions in that gene that can get mutated, they basically specify which amino acids, so which protein letters to piece together in which order. And if you swap out one of those letters, well, this would be a substitution mutation. These mutations can be drastic, have drastic effects or they can have um, not so significant effects. And this is gonna depend on how conservative they are. So basically by conservative, the different amino acids all have different properties. So some of them are really big, some of them are really small, some of them are hydrophobic. So they basically, water doesn't want to hang out with them. And some of them are hydrophilic, so water really wants to hang out with them. Some of them are charged, some of them are not charged, um, some positive, some negative. So basically, if you change something to something similar, that's going to be referred to as a conservative mutation, and it's less likely to have as much of an effect, as opposed to if you do something like drastic, such as changing a very hydrophobic or water-avoided amino acid that typically hangs out in the center of a protein into something hydrophilic, so water-loving, um, that hangs out with the, on the likes to hang out with the surface or vice versa where you have something hydrophilic that swapped for something hydrophobic. This latter case is what happens in the case of sickle cell anemia. There's this glutamate, which is a negatively charged amino acid. So it's really hydrophilic and water likes to hang out with it. And it hangs out on the surface of the protein. The sickle cell anemia mutation, it changes that to um, it changes that to a valine, which is one of those really hydrophobic ones, which normally likes to hang out in the center of the protein. When you place the valine on the outside of the protein, well, now it's going to kind of freak out because the water's not wanting to hang, going to want to hang out with it. And so it's going to try to seek out something else hydrophobic to bind to. And this causes hemoglobin molecules to kind of link up into these chains that, chains that then clog blood vessels. And this is why you get these like um, obstructed blood vessels and these sickle cell crises with extreme pain and things like this. And all that is caused by a substitution mutation. More specifically, this is caused by a mutation called E6V. We refer to it as E6V. Um, sickle cell disease, um, so different types of sickle cell can also, or related beta, um, beta thalassemias can be caused by other changes in these hemoglobin genes. But in sickle cell anemia specifically, you have this mutation E6V. 
What this notation is referring to is that the change is happening at the sixth amino acid, and it's changing a glutamate, which we abbreviate E, into a valine, which we abbreviate B. So the basic notation we use when we're talking about substitution is to put the original letter first and what it's changed to afterwards. And by before and after, I'm referring to the position of the amino acid. So in this case, it's the sixth amino acid, and we're changing it from a glutamate E to a valine B. You might also see it written like something like GLU6-VAL. So I highly recommend that if you're doing any sort of biochemistry, you memorize the abbreviations for the amino acids at the very minimum. Um, so they're three letter kind of like nickname as well as their one letter abbreviation. So you can see glutamate, we can abbreviate it GLU or E. And when we're talking about valine, we can abbreviate it VAL or B. And so in the case of this mutation then, we can refer to it as E6B. Okay, what other types of mutations? We can also have insertions, where basically you add some letters in. You can also have insertions in non-coding regions um, of the DNA, so regions that don't have the instructions for making the protein, um, or at least don't have the instructions for putting those letters together. Like um, They could be regions that are interspersing those protein coding regions, or regions at the UTRs or at the ends, or the various regulatory regions, things like this, which wouldn't affect the actual sequence of the protein being made, but they could affect how much of the protein gets made. But if we have one of those insertions in the actual protein coding sequence, the part that has the instructions for piecing together amino acids, then we can get additional amino acids to be added. This is an example of this happening is in the disease Huntington's disease. Here there's this, um, this codon, this just CAG, which codes for, stands for basically, it tells the ribosome to put in a glutamine, which we can abbreviate GLN or Q. They get this expansion of this CAG tract. So basically you get a lot of CAGs in a row. Um, and what this happens is that you get a lot of these glutamines in a row, and these can, are kind of sticky amino acids. So they can cause this protein to misfold and clump up and cause problems. And that's an example of an insertion mutation. More specifically, this is a trinucleotide repeat expansion because you have this trinucleotide, you have this single codon that's repeated over and over. Another type of change is a deletion. So here we're removing some of the letters. To indicate removed stretches of amino acids, we use this delta notation. So this delta sign, this capital, um, capital Greek delta, so this like triangle. And basically we use this before the amino acids that were, the numbers of the amino acids that were removed. So if amino acids 80 to 100 were removed, we'd write delta 80 to 100. Now, sometimes these mutations happen in the wild and sometimes they happen because we make them in the lab. One time that we make mutations in the lab is to kind of, we make truncations where we chop off a bit of the beginning end, so the end terminus or the end end, the C terminus, in order to do things like make the protein express better or see what region of a protein does what. We also might use this in order to try to get a more stable version of the protein. If you want to do something like extra crystallography where we need the protein um, to kind of like freeze in place. And so we might chop off the floppy ends in order to kind of get it, um, get it to cooperate with us. So when we're doing those, we're making truncation mutations. Um, so we might have like an N-terminal truncation or if it's at the beginning, or a C-terminal truncation if it's at the end. And this notation is referring to the fact that in a protein, one end is going to be the N-terminus, and then the other end is going to be the C-terminus. We refer to original non-mutated form as like wild type. Sometimes we abbreviate this WT and the changed versions as mutants. But again, remember that technically speaking, these aren't, it's the gene that has the mutation. These are just like amino acid substitutions. But typically in common usage, we just refer to these as mutants. More specifically, when we're making the changes like in the lab, we often refer to the different forms that we make as constructs. And we can make these different constructs in the lab using a technique called site-directed mutagenesis, where we're able to introduce mutations into that DNA to make changes to the protein. This allows us to do things like see which parts of the protein are important for doing what, as well as do things like make those truncations in order to better, e more easily study a protein. So that's the basics of mutation terminology. So remember that technically the mutation is happening at the level of the gene, but we typically, it may or may not have an effect on the protein, but we typically refer to these proteins 
um, these changed proteins as mutants as well. And we have different terms that we can refer to um, these different mutations as. So when talking about substitutions, we put the original letter first, followed by the amino acid that's changed, um, the position of the amino acids that's changed, followed by the letter of what it's changed to. For deletions, we can use this delta sign. And then for like non-mutants, non we typically refer to these as wild type or WT. And then the mutant forms, if we make them in the lab, we refer to them as constructs. So those are just some of the words we use to describe mutations in the context of biochemistry. Hope that helps you understand.